Hello and welcome to Epic Fantasy Reviews. This is Dan speaking and here is my co-host Joe. Yosh. And today we are uh, reviewing the movie She. 1960, the 1965 classic uh, which stars Peter Cushing, uh, Christopher Lee, a bunch of other people we forget the names of, and of course uh, the incredible and vivacious Ursula Andress. Who, um, honestly, is probably the most beautiful woman of the 60s, as well as, I'll be honest, one of the finest actresses I've ever seen of all times. She, mm -hmm. uh, I think she's Scandinavian, and she was a, obviously a supermodel, but she really, she really shines in this movie. Uh, she encapsulates all of the uh, violence boundless anger of course beauty but also the seductive lure of she who must be obeyed uh, mm -hmm. Aisha who is uh, I'm not sure about the actual original, original story from earlier in the 20th century but is a violent uh, figure in literature whom like, you've kind of got her being a bit of a toxic female character. You've got uh, the one uh, Semitic Jewish girl who's uh, part of that slave tribe, who's kind of a fairly balanced, nice lady. And you've got, I would argue, Callicrates, who's a pretty toxic male. And oh, have, yeah. In the male, Holly, played by the perfect Peter Cushing. Of course. And what I've... Oh, you also have with the toxic male characters, uh, Christopher Lee playing uh, Bill I... Lil or something like that. And... Or Belial or Belila. Something like that. Bell something. And we don't have the wiki page open, but... Uh, now, we just bring this up because all these violent angry characters, are also counterbalanced by more, uh, by characters just trying to survive or just trying to explore. Now, we, we're not entirely familiar with the original story, which we will be reading in a later season of Epic Fantasy Reviews, because this is one of the first fantasy stories out there with witch uh, queens and uh, immortals and whatnot. A bit of a precursor to Highlander in a lot of ways. Okay. And, but the movie that Hammer made, which is a one hour and 41 minutes long film, I would argue is one of their best. Yeah. It's from that golden age in the 60s of finest Hammer films. Mm hmm And it was funny seeing Cushing play someone who's a bit of a playboy. Yeah. Because usually Cushing's not a ladies' man. In these films, due to, I think, in some cases, him choosing roles that don't involve any perviness or anything because he's so dedicated to his wife, uh, Helen. But the thing is, in this movie, he's a ladies' man who's, who can't keep his eyes. Like, he's trying to say, give, impart wisdom early in the beginning, and he can't take his eyes off any woman in front of him. That is... <laughs> it was funny. It, it, was, it was it was distracting in the background because you have these very attractive ladies dancing. But I'm, it's not just that; it's like he's actually trying to impart some life wisdom to his surrogate slash adoptive son, uh, Leo Vincent, uh, or Callicrates, because he's the reincarnation of an ancient uh, Greek priest of Isis. But he's trying to convey some wisdom to essentially his son. Whilst, uh, like, just staring at the nearby woman or, like, just subtly flirting with her. It, it was a bit funny. So, but only Cushing could kind of pull off wisdom in that moment, but also a little hint of perviness. Mm -hmm. uh, like, pushing, Cushing was perfect in every role you gave him. Yeah. But I think he shined really in heroic roles. And as well as very quirky characters. And Holly is a very quirky but heroic character. 
And for the first, like, hour of the movie, it seems that Callicrates is really the heroic character. But then, this is where the excellent direction of the director, whom I forgot the name of, shame on me, kicks in, and you actually start to see Holly as the male lead. And the reason I say that is when he approaches Christopher Lee's character in the catacombs under uh, she's uh, Aisha's realm, uh, where the old high priests of uh, Aisha are left to, um, well, their mummified remains are placed in these alcoves standing up. There's an interesting philosophical debate where Holly's telling uh, Lee's character, oh no, uh, you know, like there, she is not immortal, she is, but there's something even more subtle that he's doing. He's kind of going, I, you look, you, I knew from the moment I looked in your eyes, you, you were a man who yearns for freedom. No man was ever meant to be a slave. And that part is utterly fascinating because you could see that Holly's playing uh, Lee's character against Aisha because he's just trying to survive. He essentially commented, you know, Dave High Priest, she wants to make uh, Calic Calicrates. Calicrates immortal like her. Immortal like her and make him her right hand man. Right hand man. But the thing is what he's We're, trying to what he's trying to tell him I think is like the moment you're gonna spend no, it's she's not gonna dispose of Elias or whatever. She's just going to... We're going to have to disagree because I think she's not... She never had any intentions of getting rid of him. She needs a stooge to run her household. Oh, of course. Yeah. But I, And Callicrates isn't going to do it. He's too lazy. And he's not I, I forgot enough. about that detail. But Lee is... His character... He's just being told, like... Okay, do you want to spend your entire life a slave? Or a free man in charge of your own destiny? Which, but the thing is, Lee's character rejects that. But it's just the idea of freedom is it was already there, but it's kind of it's watered like a flower by Cushing's character Holly in order to reap dissension and rebellion. And the reason he does this is because, as much as he's called a guest, Cushing's character is a hostage and a captive. Because the thing is, at the beginning of the movie, they follow Leo into the desert. They follow him to try and find Kumar, the, the ancient kingdom, only to find that it's not ancient. It's still ongoing under the command of she who will be obeyed. And the queen of Kumar is only interested in getting her husband back, Calicrates, or Leo Vincent, as his reincarnation is known. And But Leo kind of fell into lust for a uh, Jewish foot soldier's or a Semitic woman's, uh, Semitic guy's daughter, who's used to be one of the foot soldiers in her army, when he disobeyed the uh, queen and was reduced to the position of chief of the slave tribes. And, you know, so uh, Holly's in a very delicate position because it... When he does try to say, oh, there's something more you need to know, uh, Leo, uh, Lee's character shows up to threaten him with a bunch of soldiers and to shut him up. And there are scenes like that that appear. So it's very clear, Holly, as much as he's trying to... He's just trying to get the heck out of Dodge. He's just trying to survive. Mm -hmm. But it's very... It's, the thing he, is, he, the he, court politics, he's got to play the game. He wants to save his son. But he he also has to try and play politics because his son's too stupid to do that. Yeah. So it falls upon him to try and save his best friend slash valet and son and try to outfox Aisha. Mm-hmm. And turning Lee's character, and Christopher Lee does a really good job looking at his eyes, Christopher Lee's character looks empty and hollow. It's not every but, actor that could pull that just even with the eyes. But who in other scenes seems a little, uh, I don't want to say disappointed, but there's growing frustration behind his eyes. But at the same time, there's initially loyalty, but then there's a growing frustration 
jealousy for Callicrates and anger. Like there's a slow progression and Lee is a master character actor. And he's one of the actors whom I would say every role he did perfectly. It, it's one thing to do good acting, but to get even the eyes involved. Yeah, the trouble though with Lee was he didn't always have directors worthy of his talents. Yeah. Th not, that... Yeah, not every actor was a uh, uh, Fisher or Lucas who could bring out all of his genius. Uh, because, well, he could bring out his own genius in every movie, but the problem is none of the not every director could make the movie good enough for Lee, worthy mm -hmm. of his name. And that's something that I find terribly frustrating about Lee's filmography. It's full of great movies, but there's also quite a few duds in there. Well, not because of Lee. He, ch he saves every scene he's ever in in those terrible movies. But, he, but there's only so much he can do. Mm -hmm. But in this movie, thankfully, everything else is on point. The cinematography, you've the got, music. You've got Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee in the same room. Yeah, that alone. That alone makes the, make the does movie perfect. Raises the movie uh, up. Absolutely. And, what's and more, the fact that their discussions are very philosophical. It's, it's not the first and last time that they've shared movies. Yeah. They, I guess, were good friends. They're best friends. Okay. They're best friends, those two and Vincent Price. Mm-hmm. But the, the thing is, uh, in this movie, uh, the most... I would actually say what's fascinating is that the one who really steals the show is Ursula Andress. The mm -hmm. actress for Aisha is amazing. The way that she, commanding presence. Where she, at first with Leo, she seems like a nice uh, girl, an angelic uh, lady from. Where even the lighting is done that, and then when you Leo, see her in her, her Leo home. leaves, and she continues with a bit of the same tone of voice she used, but there was venom in there. And then when she comes in with her entire uh, imperial regalia. And the way she holds herself. It's like, for a first-time actress, boom! Yeah. And the way she memorized her lines and gave her lines, it's like she was on a Shakespearean... Uh, I don't think she ever did any Shakespeare before then. Yeah, it's just the way she delivered those lines. Perfect. Perfect. It's like the female variant of Lee or Cushing. Mm-hmm. And, like, admittedly, the actor for Calicrates a few times was a little stilted. Mm -hmm. and wouldn't. I'm just saying he was good, but not as good as the other two male leads or her. And even the actor who plays the uh, father of um, of the one uh, uh, l girl who dies near the end. Yeah, spoiler alerts. Um, Calicrates' other lover. He should have picked her. Yeah, but her, her dad, the actor playing her dad is perfect. Because, like, I love the scene where, because uh, one thing we have to comment upon in this review is that in terms of lore, Aisha is also utilizing a bit. Now, the thing is, she achieved immortality thanks to a mystic from 2,000 years ago who showed her the secrets of witchery and witchcraft and the blue flame, which it gave her her immortality if she were to stride in once. She has since built a temple slash castle slash palace slash fortress to keep others from claiming her gift the gift of immortality or i would argue the curse and over the past 2000 years she's built a civilization a local one a small one but dreams of of once the rest of the world nukes itself into oblivion she will rise from the ashes and claim all rule of all of humanity alongside her beloved calligrates but the thing about the lore here is she's a bit of a eugenics type woman. And the thing is that you notice, now real quick, some of her men, her soldiers are dressed as Romans. And while she boasts about the length and history of Egypt, you can clearly see that she has a grudging admiration for the Romans' prowess and abilities on the other hand, all of the... Now, there are pecking orders. 
to her slaves. But everybody is a slave under her. Everybody. And at the bottom ranks those who are disgraced, those whites who are disgraced, and of course, uh, black tribesmen, who are kept deliberately as primitive as possible so as to make them easier to control. And the minute they start to um, progress further than what she would like culturally, um, the shock troops are sent in. And now the thing is, though, they worship her as a goddess because she's immortal. She's immovable. She's, you know, and she is utterly terrifying. But every once in a while, she calls the men from the tribe to Thunder send the message. Fish. And the one disgraced foot soldier who I think is partially Jewish in universe and disgraced himself because he disobeyed her orders and was appointed the chief of these of this black tribe uh she ends up well killing the guy's daughter but the thing is what i love about my favorite scene with him is he admits that he was disgraced ashamed and angered to an extent when he was first appointed chief but he tells really quickly and quietly uh he begs uh Calicrates is, uh friends not to take uh not to take their fear uh and their desire to basically kill leo to to prevent no to try and stop in some form their goddess from achieving all that she wants and he says don't take it personally really because he's like yeah but the other thing he tells them is when i first came here i didn't want to be here this was my punishment. I was disgraced. I was to lord over these people until she grew tired of my very existence and would have my chet, essentially my head chopped off. I didn't love these people at first, but when I, but I have since come to regard them as my sons and daughters. I love them. And I will not allow anyone to harm them. But unfortunately, I cannot rise up against she who must be obeyed lest she'll lest she'll destroy them. And I could never live with that. Or something to that effect. And it's a very beautiful scene where you see a man who, he realizes she's evil, but he can't move because he's scared of losing, essentially, his children. But in turn, the tribe tries, no, like, goes by, like, they don't listen to him. They take Calicrates and go to do an entire ritual to kill him. But at the same time, they refuse to harm those who are guests in their chieftain's home or their chieftain. Mm -hmm. So you see... A, and, and the movie does a great job where at that point, they make it seem like the tribesmen are evil. They're, they're just... They're another obstacle. But as the story progresses, you realize... They're good. They're good and they had very good reasons. For wanting to kill Calicrates. They, they wanted uh, Holly and Leo to leave... Uh, leave and since they refuse and to save them and and they're also trying to protect um, the chieftain's daughter whom later at the end you see like because uh after she has her killed the thing is it's in a scene where she does she pretty much takes a dagger that can't even kill her points it at her breast and says this here beats my heart and try and kill me to Leo. He can't because he's not he's not man enough to save an innocent woman against a woman who's pure evil. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say he's not man enough is just like he makes a show of manhood throughout the movie. Now the actor I think did a good job here as did the direction in showing that Leo at his core is a coward. Mm -hmm. And he, I'm going to say this. Calicrates is trash. And it's almost hilarious how Aisha is so in love with him and obsessed with him. And how Leo seems to inspire love in every woman he runs into. But he's not worthy of them. He doesn't have their brains. I'll even say Aisha and the one woman are intelligent. They're brilliant. They're beautiful. They're like... And the thing is, even the characters in universe acknowledge this. Even Holly, though he loves Leo, acknowledges the man's not very bright. Mm -hmm. And yet, Leo keeps screwing up. But in the scene after the whole dagger thing, and uh, the Roman dressed soldiers deliver the ashes and say, Here's your daughter. Here's your daughter. They go to spill it. No, they start pouring the ashes. Yeah. Mockingly. But what I love is that 
the black actors do a great job. The African British actors, I think they are. I think they were African British. All kind of look, like most of them are jaws drop. Even the women, they and some yeah. of them like start to cover their faces. Others look you to have, their chieftain. In you have the chieftain that stops the uh, ash. Four, the well, ash some from, of them did escape. Yeah, and, and screams the, in their language, "Kill them!" What? And the thing is, what I love is that, that now the this is where the African actors really shine. Those of African descent. I don't know if they were actual Africans or not, but like you see the grief in their eyes. They, the thing is, this girl may have had different skin color, but she was the most popular person in the tribe amongst she, them. She was sweet she and was kind. Family. And they all fly off the, the handle. Because, and I'll say this, they, they throw themselves at the guards with righteous fury and, and the force of their grief and literally tear them from limb. They they go and attack uh, Aisha's temple. They tear down her forces. And it's just for sheer numbers and the or, and the intelligence of their chieftain who I'm not saying he's smarter than the rest of them. It's just he knows the interior. He knows the soldiers and whatnot and how they operate. And Aisha and her head priest are distracted by quarreling over the blue flame. But well, the other thing is I think the African soldiers or tribesmen actually I have to consider this they did plan their assault really well but what's interesting is they waited for Holly and his valet Jove to step outside when the guards were had lowered their guard to exchange some last minute barbs with Holly and I think they waited because here's the thing none of those um, uh, tribesmen wanted to harm Holly and Jove and like you pointed out, they're freaking good people. And they're like, we can't harm these two. But they waited for them to be safe before they charged. And they're charging all around them. But the mm-hmm. thing is, Holly and Joe then throw themselves into the midst to support these tribesmen. Although I would argue, although they're World War I vets in universe, Joe is younger and better equipped in the fight. And you see that Peter Cushing's character of Holly, while he's the most brilliant man in universe, he's the smartest guy around. Ah, uh, he's starting to get old. He suffered some World War One injuries, and he's quickly overpowered by some of these guardsmen. Mm-hmm. And he, it, it's a great scene. And I'll be honest, I love the scene. Like I said, I love the scene of the ashes being poured, and mm-hmm. just the, these tribesmen looking in horror and looking to their chieftain with utter compassion before rage overtakes them and they take mm-hmm. it down on the guards. It's such a great scene. One theme that seems to show up would be. Fear and cowardice. The tribesmen, you see that they could have taken control, but... They needed the incentive. They needed the incentive, and they were afraid. They were cowards. One of the primary ones that was willing to challenge Aisha was the, was the one woman. I, I don't... No, she wasn't, I think. Okay. I would argue they were not cowards. They were trying to resist. Their chieftain was just scared. He was the scared one. And okay. they didn't want to disobey him. They did not want to go again. Like, they loved him too much to disobey him fully. Okay. And it, I it, think that they were aware, if so long as Aisha is not distracted, because remember, they timed this assault uh, for when the uh, comet would fly by and the blue flame would light up. I think they timed it, because if she was in command... There is no way they could have overthrown her. Okay, you you got me there. But and her and her head priest. But the thing is, I would argue the chieftain was more cowardly in some ways. Uh, but he was frozen by love for his people, for his new people. Mm-hmm. And the one girl was not unafraid of her. She was the most terrified in the tribe of Aisha. Yes, but she did try to tell Leo, don't, don't. But at the same time, she planned to leave, regardless of what Leo did. Because she was that scared of Aisha. Mm-hmm. Despite her love for Leo, she was terrified of Aisha. And who could blame her? Yeah. Leaving would have been one courageous act. Because she didn't know much about the outside world, but she was willing to confront it. Well, yes, she was feet. willing to go back to her tribe. Okay. That's okay. what she me- I mean by she was going back. All right. I don't think... I don't know what I was thinking then. Yeah, I mean... 
But the but the you, the thing you the have the other thing with the world building in this movie that's good. And we're treating it like a fantasy movie to an extent. I know it's supposed to be horror. It is, but it's also kind of action adventure like Indiana Jones before Indiana Jones, but it's also kind there, of fantasy. There are fantasy elements. But the head priest played by Lee I love how he tries to make a bid for the uh, blue flame and arrives just inches short when he's dying. Mm-hmm. But it's interesting that he overpowers Calicrates in a fight. But the one who kills him to, with a spear to the back is Aisha. And that's the thing. I find it, there's a recurring theme in some ways. Who's wearing the pants in that relationship between her and Calicrates? Her. She's the more terrifying force. He's, I dare say, a little spineless and cowardly and... Clearly with a philandering eye. Now, at the beginning of the movie, he's they make reference that he is courageous. He is a good soldier. But here's the thing. He is courageous up until... But here's the interesting thing. This is a Fall from Grace movie, but like it's in a different kind of context than, say, Anakin Skywalker or Arthas, where in their case, the more corrupted, or at least... With Arthas, the more mistakes he began making, the more obsessed he grew, the more courageous and intrepid he did. He became. Although, that also has to do with him eventually just saying, screw my personal safety. Anakin, I know him and Anakin became bonkers eventually. But the thing is, Anakin, the more corrupted he became, the more impulsive he became. Caligrides, it's interesting because he's more impulsive early on. but the Or Leo, I should say. But the more Leo is becoming Caligrides the less impulsive and more cowardly he's becoming, the more broken as a man. Like, it's just pathetic how he just kneels before uh, Aisha and then follows her like a puppy dog to her chambers. Um, Like, she even admits that it was she in his previous life who killed him for daring to cheat on her. Because that's what got her banished from Egypt. But then, like, he's still not able to stand up to her afterwards. You take the Leo at the beginning of the movie, before he became obsessed with her. I think he could. But you take him at the end, he's pathetic. He's cowardly. Mm Mm-hmm. And then when, uh, it's like looking at him when Aisha dies. He's repulsed by her elderly appearance. And And she's trying to reach out to him. And then, uh, the way uh, he breaks down and cries is like, I have no sympathy. He chose his fate. Like, yeah. He chose immortality. I love the philosophical discussion between him and Holly, where Holly just tells him, perhaps in my younger days I would not have hesitated to take to get immor- to become immortal. And what about now? Well, it's not the same thing. Like, as your, you know, as your mind matures, it gets less attractive. Well, why not? There's a better place after this life, and it doesn't... Immortality doesn't interest me. Not at my age. Maybe at your age, people are tempted by it, but... Oh. Like, Holly just sees it as... It's a sorry deal because you can't have kids. You can't, like, mature with the love of your life. You can't... There's so much you'd be giving up. Mm Mm-hmm. And And putting the sequel book aside... And a terrible sequel movie... Uh, you, you can honestly ask... I know in the second book, uh, Aisha does come back. Yeah, same with the second movie where it's just terrible. The second movie's terrible. But you can make... Uh, putting this movie just alone in its context, would Calicrates have to wait another 2,000 years for Aisha? Possibly. It's like an is more... I like that it's only like 25 years or something in that second story, but yeah... I I and then I think here's the funny thing. I think he's likely to indulge himself quite a bit during those two thousand years waiting for her, but he would wait. I'll give him that. But he'd indulge himself quite a bit in the meantime. Yeah. Ironically, she was celibate during the two thousand years. She admits to it, and it's just any scene between her and Cushing, though, and even her and Lee, it's just. It's any like no other actor or actress could possibly steal the scene from those two, but she does it almost with ease. And I'll say this: as beautiful as she is, 
there is something that Ursula Andress had even more than beauty. Charisma. And this is where I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to kind of crap all over the Marvel movies. They don't have an actress of her caliber. And I am... I'm just saying, I'm going to go on a bit of a tangent here. The tr People say Scar Jo, for example, is so beautiful, so charismatic. One, no offense, she's kind of pretty, but she was prettier in like 2007 or 8 when she was in The Prestige. After that, I don't know. She's, like, she's kind of... But the thing with uh, Scar Jo is... She is not charismatic. I know people want to say she is, because let me tell you, you've only seen the MCU movies. You've never seen movies with an actual uh, decent female actress or a woman who can act. I'm sorry, guys. Go watch other movies. I know this is a little patronizing, but guys, the, like you watch this movie, Urs Ursula Andress is freaking like charismatic. Speaking of Marvel movies, the, there's one character in the Marvel movies, played by one actor, that uh, actually, that her gravitas and her regalness remind me of. Magneto? You guessed it in one. Well, that's Sir Ian McKellen, who's one of the most charismatic actors of all times. It's like as Magneto. You see how... how I he... love when he flips his cape over his hand, arm. Yeah. Like... Okay, I know a lot of people don't like X3, but I love how he says, she was so beautiful. But it's like, wow. He says it golfly, but it's just, he's so freaking regal. But McKellen's a perfect actor. He's and actor. the fact that the regalness that this first-time actress projects, projects is similar to experienced Ian, actors like McKellen, that's Lee, she and Cushing. Ian McKellen is who she reminded me of. She's like a female version of him. Yeah, and and Sir Sir Ian McKellen is a very brilliant actor. Oh, he's a genius, and he comes from that generation of actor that do, does do their research. They do immerse themselves, but there's a few actors today that do it, but not like back then. And they and the ones who do it are typically over in Japan or Korea, and Britain or or in certain parts of Europe, but not in North America anymore. You don't have actors in North America or mm -hmm. American or Canadian who really do that. Yeah, the idea... But Ursula Andress, like, in terms of acting, like, we've talked about the world building, we've talked enough about the characters, but as far as the actors go, we've already mentioned Cushing and Lee are perfect as always. The guy who does Jove is really good. I really like him. Mm -hmm. He nails he's, the part. He's a movie-only character, but he's a really good character. He reminded me of Jonathan from The Mummy. He reminded me more of, uh, in some ways, yeah, but he's not, he's not cowardly. He, mm -hmm. he reminded me more of Alfred Pennyworth. Okay, okay, I see it. Yeah, now, that said, though, he's, a, he, he's Alfred who has more combat skills than his, than his boss. But, once again, I have to repeat, Ursula Andress, wow, does she steal the show. The actress who plays the, uh, uh, I think she's... Middle Eastern, or she was of Middle Eastern descent. The actress who plays uh, Calicrates' other lover and uh, her dad, perfect. Now, as to the racial issues, the eugenic stuff, as always with eugenics, it's racist. But at the beginning, you went, oh, this is cringe, with the African tribe. And I was like, yeah, it is racist in some ways. Bear in mind the time period, the 60s. But then, once you see a bit of the world building and how Aisha tri is running them, and you see that even the whites are slaves in her home. Yes, she has... The, the highest ranks are the, her two black uh, handmaidens mm -hmm. and uh, the head priest. But they're all slaves still. And once you realize that everybody's a slave, and that... Now, that said, she has some African bodybuilders, essentially working as her, in her Roman-style troops and whatnot. So the impression I got was, yes, she prefers the white males for... Now, you don't see any white females, interestingly. I have the theory that she puts them down mm -hmm. at birth or something. But the white males are her personal guard with a few black males. So the strongest of the black tribesmen are promoted. But the rest are kept low, crushed, 
and occasionally cold. Mm -hmm. Black females are, well, left alone to a limited extent in slavery or as her personal handmaidens. Mm -hmm. And it's really, like, but the I, thing is, it it's not Hammer being racist, but they're showing how evil and vile Aisha is. Yeah. When she left the, uh, I think, the modern world, was she shown with the black bodyguards again? What do you mean? I don't... What do from you mean? from uh, the beginning? Oh, when she appears in a vision. Yeah, because... No, like, that was a vision, her using her magic. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, there were black guards there. Yeah. Do they appear later on? Yeah. Okay. Those same guys appear at the end. All right. Uh, uh, one of them is, I think, her executioner. All right. But she does... Dude look buff, though. Yeah, because... Because I... I got the impression that in the beginning, they were used for in, also intimidation. That's what they're there for, yeah. Because uh, it's one thing All to see... All of her troops are. Yeah, it's one thing to see a buff white guy like that. But a buff black guy... Is even more intimidating in some ways. Exactly, and that's what she was counting on. Which and shows that she is aware of racial issues. And, and psychology. And, exactly. But it's interesting because... Uh, like, you have Cushing and uh, the one Semitic uh, chieftain who try to argue for the rights of these people. And in-universe, it's 1918, and these guys, you got to bear in mind, I think Britain already had completed a lot of its, uh, mm -hmm. its uh, civil rights stuff. And the idea was there was no segregation in Britain at the time. and There was none. Except with, I think the, no wait, the Irish, they had just finished, stopped doing that. So, to characters like Holly and Jove, the idea of, of this uh, racial pecking order was horrifying. And you have the characters react with a great deal of shock and horror to it. Mm -hmm. Which, but at the end, they all look different. Exactly. They're the matter of identity and reclaiming it. Yeah, I noticed that too. And that it's was like, that was, I would say this, that was Mastercraft direction. And, that's, and put together with uh, the entire concept of fear and cowardice. And overcoming fear. Mm -hmm. and, fro and throwing off the yoke of conquerors. Mm -hmm. Of conquerors, of uh, eugenics. Eugenics, of cults. You can reclaim your identity. Yeah. But you have to be willing so, to fight for it alongside your brothers and sisters. Exactly. And sometimes... Or, excuse me, as a lot of my friends would put it, brothers and sisters. <laughs> uh, but the, it's just, it's a mesmerizing movie. It's a great film. We've gone over the themes. The, like, the direction is just, holy mac. The, the direction's perfect. Some of the... And, and I would dare say, I think there was a bit of the 1960s, first wave, uh, civil rights stuff and whatnot probably showing in this film. And I really... Like, I'm not an activist sort. I'm not that sort. I, I don't get involved in that stuff. Uh, not because I don't support stuff like that. It's just... I'm an artist, a critic, and, I, and I'm and i not into politics. But I thought there was something moving and inspiring mm -hmm. in a lot when they throw off the yoke. But there was also a tragedy because, you know, it took one beautiful girl... To die, and I think that the tribe was ready to fight to reclaim themselves. If their just, individuality is just their chieftain was too scared, and I think there was a bit of disloyalty between him and them in this regard. He failed them over the fact of a hundred of them being killed every once in a while, and him never moving until his daughter died. And I think he owes them big time for that. Mm -hmm. But Which, that said. You yes. can see that despite his failings as a chieftain, they love him. And, when, and he loves them. And when uh, they want to k kill Leo, he's, like, he's trying to say, forgive them, forgive them. And, and he, but he's also trying to plead with his own people, don't do this. This is just going to get her angry. You're, it's going to cost us some of your lives. Don't do this, please. So he's trying to plead with everyone. And if it wasn't for the centurion's showing up, they would have killed Leo. Yeah. Although, yeah, like... They they would have been probably wiped out to a man. Yeah, because her anger is boundless. And, but, yeah, uh, this f movie is mesmerizing in every scene. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, The themes are, I think, timeless. Uh, The characters are great. Even the extras in the background, like you pointed out, are just amazing. Mm -hmm. And, like, I just love the shock of betrayal, grief, and then anger and outrage. Mm -hmm. And, like, oh, the director. Oh, man. But, yeah, like, we're going to have to watch at some point some more Ursula Andress movies because she's (laughs) just an amazingly charismatic actress. I hope she had a long career. Yeah, I hope so, too. Because... Honestly, if they were making... I'm just saying. Let's say they had the graphics and technical capabilities of today back then. And they had a lot of the material. I would dare say Aowen would have to be played by Ursula Andress. And maybe someone like Jean Grey or... Or uh, as far as nerdy characters would have to be played by her. Heck, part of me is like... Kind of thinks that if you ever... Where was she when Leia Organa was being casted? Like, it should have... I know she might have been too old by then because you need a, mm-hmm. you need a 19-year-old to play Leia. If, but at the same time, she, like, she had... Now, if nothing against Carrie Fisher, but in episode 5 and 6, she was not charismatic at all. She was barely conscious. She was ill. She was drug-addled. This is not me trashing Carrie Fisher. Heaven bless her. But this is a fact. But the thing is, Ursula Andress would have played a killer Leia Organa. You know who else she would have been killer at playing? Mm-hmm. Enchantress from Marvel. Yes. She does have the beauty. She has the charisma, the regalness. Yeah, and most of all, Eowyn. But anyways, thankfully Carrie gave us at least uh, a couple of great movies and and uh, episode four, because in there Carrie's just perfect. Yes. Uh, but, huh. yeah... How would you rate this movie? Rating time. All right. Uh, uh, let me see. This movie... I'll be honest. As time passes, I'm getting kind of tired of long movies. Yes, I could understand that. It's a chore and sometimes... But this is nice and not too long. I watch it when I'm really sick. I watch this movie all the time. Mm-hmm. And I never get sick of it. I notice new details every time I watch it. Like, uh, uh, did you did you notice the uh, the similarities between the different kinds of slaves? Yes, and then I notice how different they all look at the end. Uh, uh, I think probably like three point three or four. This is one of those perfect movies. I don't think added time would improve. The only problem I have is maybe the Leo actor... Like, I understand he's supposed to be good-looking and kind of dumb in-universe. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I would have liked a bit of better acting from him. But that said, he's not terrible. He's just middling at best. Yeah. Uh, but he's still good in quite a few scenes. But it's hard to be stand out when you're surrounded by Lee Cushing and Ursula Andress. Yeah. Although he does do a pretty good job in some scenes. So, 3.3. 3. Yeah. I will say... Three and a quarter. As you mentioned, the uh, character Leo comes across as wooden. And the walking transition scenes. I actually normally like them. Yeah. I like those ones. But this one went on and on and on. The fact that you had to go fast forward on them. Well, it's because I was tired. But normally I watch the transition scenes. Yes. And I, and I pay avid attention. I um, do. I, I do always, as well. I always watch them, but yesterday I was a little sick. So and, I just kind of... And, and, went, I, and I wanted to finish by by 6 o'clock. Yeah, so, it's just... They went on for over five minutes. Yeah. Anyways, if you like this video... Like, like comment, subscribe, sh- share, share, leave a comment. Oh, I already said that. And... and uh, uh, and uh, make sure that the bell is rung for she who shall be obeyed. obeyed. She commands it.